This is an Eton Powerware uh, PW5115 500i 500VA GPS and I've been on the prowl for one of these for quite some time and this guy showed up in the trash um, about a week ago and the reason for that is that these are pure sine wave little switch mode GPS's and I've been wanting to turn one of these into a little inverter for the van and uh, the obvious upside to doing this is uh, a pure sine wave 500VA inverter probably uh, and uh, it costs me nothing so it's pretty good price performance given that I it can manage to make it run continuously and uh, you know it's obviously going to need some upgraded cooling at the moment it's passively cooled and uh, the heat sinks inside are not any larger than they need to be in order to drain the original uh, 9 amp hour battery. And just for posterity, here's what the ass of the unit looks like. It's a pretty low end unit, you've just got uh, your e Ethernet over voltage protection, your outputs and your inputs and all your labels and stuff. And uh, if you look very close at this you can see the model number and uh, the input and output ratings uh, and it's rated for 500 VA or 320 watts so uh, usual GPS gibberish with a VA and watts uh, probably going to be closer to 320 watts than 500 but we're here to find out and here's the inside of the unit uh, so you've got your battery coming in here uh, going, going straight to the battery compartment and uh, you've got to uh, I'm not entirely certain of the topology of this inverter but it seems to just keep some 12 volts battery voltage across these two 16 volt caps and then it's uh, the lack of an output filter suggests to me that it's just uh, modulating everything on the 12 volt primary and filtering it through this coil and some little caps on the secondary there it isn't like those cheap inverters where you just have basically a boost regulator giving you a 200 volts DC and then just chopping that up in little segments with a secondary inverter step but rather this is a more integrated solution where, where they integrate the voltage boost circuit and the inverter into one which is probably does good for efficiency but we're, again we're gonna find out no, beyond that, there's not a whole lot going on. Although we do have, if we flip this over, a large choke there, or possibly transformer. I'm not entirely certain as to how that's connected up in the circuit. Uh, I think these are line interactive units, so it could just be an AVR transformer giving the, this unit the ability to boost or buck the voltage of a grid if necessary, but it could also be an output filter. It, it isn't a transformer though, in the traditional sense because it just has uh, one winding with uh, these three w leads going into it. Proper servicing procedure. So that was removing the battery cage because originally these units come with uh, uh, this little metal connecting thing. Uh, this is the battery cover and this slides into place there and we've got two connecting tabs, basically like car fuses, uh, which connect the battery only after you've closed the battery hatch. That's because the battery charging these is uh, not isolated from the grid, so else you'd run a risk of getting a pretty nasty zap out of these uh, when you're changing the battery and the unit's plugged in. Uh, and uh, since I won't be using the battery charging this at all ever again, uh, I'm just going to bypass that by uh, soldering uh, this uh, Anderson connector uh, just on the secondary side of those plugs and eliminate a bit of resistance in the procedure. And with an Anderson connector mounted, all that's left to do is hook it up and turn it on. Uh, that's an idle current of about one and a half amps. So you know, now all I've got to do is uh, mute that and uh, pick up some loads to it and see how hot it runs. And as a testament to the fact that this actually is a pure sine wave inverter, uh, I've got this uh, power meter hooked up. And I happen to know that these use a capacitive dropper arrangement for the power supply. And if you connect one of these up to a square wave output, uh, they go instantly boom because all the high frequency harmonics pass right through the capacitive dropper and basically overpower all the circuitry. Well, and with an input voltage of about 
12.85 volts at 27 amps and an output power of 274 watts. Uh, I just did the math and we get to just shy of 80% efficiency out of this thing, which isn't too bad, but not super good either. And if I feel these heat sinks, which have about 12 volts AC by the way, since they're on the primary side of the inverter, uh, these are getting uh, just to the brink of too hot to touch. So, yeah, we're definitely going to have to make some quite considerable cooling improvements in this thing. Something which is quite surprising though is that the capacitors, so the bolt capacitance on the primary of the inverter seem to be generating a lot of heat on their own because uh, they are definitely the hottest part in the entire area. There's nothing real around them to uh, transmit that heat into them. The PCB doesn't seem to be as hot as they are. So that's a bit worrisome. Perhaps the ESR is just a bit too high to work very well in this application. Yep, I just checked it, and these are Jamicon WG series caps, which uh, have respectable specifications, but uh, compared to something like this uh, Panasonic FM capacitor, uh, they have at three times higher internal resistance and can handle about two thirds of a ripple current. So I think I'm just going to swap those out for a uh, couple of these guys uh, since I'm at it, because these are considerably better caps. Oh, well, hello there. It seems that perhaps we've got a cause for why they discarded this device. That is some definite leakage going on around those legs of that cap. There we go, new caps installed, uh, but I figured while I'm here soldering I'll just uh, add some extra current reinforcing to these traces because uh, this thing's going to rub about 50 amps when it's full of loads and these traces are not up for the task even though they are tuned and they do have a lot of little uh, bridges going on the top side to beef them up but eh, some 2.5 square millimeter installation wire is going to do a lot better job. Alright, moving onwards with the experiment, I've figured out that using this fan and the original heatsink, even at medium speed, the fan gives more than ample cooling for all the parts involved, really, uh, from caps to transformer to heatsink. The heatsink doesn't even get, get above about like 35 degrees for a run this at 8 volts, so I'm quite happy with that result. I might end up not even upgrading the heatsinks at all, actually. And I've further figured out that the thing in the other end of this wire is entirely unnecessary for any function other than the AVR functionality when the GPS is running on grid. So uh, I'm not going to need this at all because it will power on and run just fine off a battery even though it's just not connected at all. And that's very good news because uh, I've had a bit of a dig around in the car and the place I want to mount this is actually a bit... Uh, I cramped and it's going to be a bit interesting seeing how well we can fit this PCB in there. Another quite important factor as to the viability of this thing is how much power will it draw from the battery when it's connected up and doing nothing. Uh, because uh, if this thing requires, uh, if this thing draws more than a couple of milliamps, uh, I'm going to need to have an external switch on it and if I was that's going to draw 50 to 100 amps, you know, at most, uh, that, that's uh, a quite hefty switch or relay. So I've got the meter connected up in series, so let's just see how much power it draws. And that's pretty much nothing. 0.1 milliamps and falling as the caps are getting charged. So I can just wire this up to run uh, straight to the battery and just use the internal switch. And if we flick it, it draws about 200 milliamps while the relay is drawn. Excellent. Good news. Another important factor to consider in this particular case, while well, we're dealing with a unit that's got the battery entirely enclosed and not available from the outside at all, is, is the ground on the case the same as the ground here? Because we could have a quite a significant voltage between this battery ground and the case. So let's check that out. Volts AC. And we've got 1.4 volts at some silly kilohertz. 
and two of the positive, and 1.2 volts. So that's looking pretty good. We don't seem to have and any kind of real kind of connection between those two, but the uh, real test comes when we actually try and bridge them out because that's what's going to be happen. That's what's going to happen when we put this in the car. All right, so for effect in case something is lurking which we haven't seen, I've connected a 100 or 1k resistor up between the battery negative and the ground on the case. So if something's uh, actually going to cause it to flow any current there, we're going to be aware of it. So let's try it out. Now that's looking mighty peaceful. I actually made a critical error there because this wire, which has since been removed, was not connected to the battery negative because these guys weren't installed. So I figure that out after I'd soldered this little ground cable there between the primary and secondary of the inverter figuring everything was okay and uh, I might have been setting myself up for a mighty big bang in doing that but thankfully though it's still okay whoo all right so as you could see that I have now uh, freed the inverter PCB from the uh, case because we're not going to be needing that anymore it just restricts airflow uh, so beyond that, I've also, you know, as you also saw, uh, made the ground wire go from the 8-bit uh, side ground just straight onto the battery negative terminal. And that means that we get uh, chassis ground through this connector, which is going to run straight to the battery of a car, and we don't have to worry about any ground loops or uh, horrible stuff like that. We'll just have one single ground point. Beyond that, I've also added a quite significant beefing up to the low voltage high current tracks here as you can see because they were running a bit hotter than I wanted them to and yeah these tracks were not suited for 35 50 amps continuously uh, but some 2.5 square millimeter installation wire should do the trick and uh, I think this thing might be almost ready to go I've also gone through the top of advice and just mechanically secured a bunch of stuff so that it isn't just wobbling around. Most notably, the entire 8-bit stage of the inverter, especially this capacitor was sitting in like one centimeter long legs and it was just flopping around. Even normal it would be moving around if it just moved the unit. So I shortened the legs and stuffed some white goop underneath it and I think we should be pretty sturdy by now. So, now all that remains to do is to firmly profile it and uh, construct some kind of pay supply for a fan. So, mounting. Originally, uh, we are inside the car now, uh, I, I was about to mount this inverter in uh, uh, this area. Now I've removed the interior, but uh, sadly the PCB was ever so slightly larger than I expected. And there's more stuff around here than I expected. So, that's just a no-go. So, I've moved on to considering uh, the second option which is to mount it uh, in here underneath the spare tire which is normal resides here because uh, we have this rather large empty area and this is the level at which the spare tire ends now, underneath a car on this uh, uh, kind of uh, aerodynamic uh, thing finger magic and uh, I have a whole bunch of these uh, storage boxes which are pretty they're very good grade plastic uh, not, not very UV resistant but that's not going to be an issue down there but these are very mechanically sturdy so I figured I'd uh, put a PCB in one of these since it fits just fine uh, construct a proper mounting for it of course and uh, flip it upside down and uh, Mount it. Like so, basically. And I'm going to have to make a, a cutout on each side for uh, the air inlet and out outlet so that uh, I can get some cooling for this thing. But that shouldn't be an issue. I'll have to make some kind of a shroud over it just to make sure it's watertight. And uh, I think that's going to work out pretty okay. 
box fits a lot better the other way around, but I'd prefer to have the gasket down down low rather than up high because even if I drill some holes in the bottom there's going to be some water entering so I'd rather have the water entering down low and exiting down low rather than having it enter up high and exit down low so that's what I'm going to do now I'm going to make some kind of a plastic mount here and uh, put the board like so basically and here's the mounting plate uh, it's just uh, a piece of a TV heat uh, light spreader plastic which I've drilled a few holes in and uh, cut to size using uh, a normal angle grinder and the board will just mount like so uh, I had to drill another hole in the PCB actually because there was no mounting hole uh, up here so you, it would have been unsupported all around here and that's not cool so I drilled that there's nothing there so it doesn't matter and there's the mounting plate mounted to the lid of the uh, container. Uh, I just mounted it using uh, some of this uh, automotive uh, asphalty stuff, which is normally used for just soundproofing stuff, really. I use it all the time. It makes a pretty okay low duty adhesive if you need to, and yeah, it was all I happened to have at hand. My silicone's dried up, so it'll do. At least we get a cool zebra texture. Just like on. The can. And I've now moved on to the thermal side of things as you might be able to hear. And this is what the a kind of waterproofed box now looks like. So, uh, what I've done now is uh, most obviously I've cut up an old uh, water container, just a normal square water bottle, one of these guys, and uh, slapped it onto these sides. This is just a mock up but that will give it a bit of resistance to water splashing from the sides since I obviously need to have these big cutouts for the air moving through the unit and you can see my thermocouple there which is coupling straight to the hotter of the two heat sinks inside of the device and on the other side we have uh, a 92 millimeter uh, 600 milliamp fan uh, sucking air through this little air guide inside you can see it right there through the uh, transparent uh, shell of the case and uh, this it's proved to be very important to actually guide the air over the heat sinks because as you saw it's running at about 45 degrees with everything mounted and I'm not really certain how hot I can run this heat sink and still have reasonable margins for not blowing it up granted that this is running under 100% load right now so I suppose it's doing pretty okay I've also drilled some holes and mounted some uh, waterproof uh, connectors on the end or rather cable pass-throughs on the end of the box and this is uh, obviously the battery power and this is the 230 volt 8 and this is going to be where the control wire which is going to go into the cab of the vehicle is going to come out and just to show up by ugly engineering there's the actual fan I just used an angle grinder with a grinding wheel to cut these slots and then I cut out a few in the middle uh, with a dremel in order to improve airflow because it was a bit too restrictive otherwise. Now, I didn't want to remove too much plastic since uh, this plastic is kind of brittle when you're working with it so you, know, you can see it cracked there which was a bit of a whoopsie. And beyond that the fan is mounted with uh, some pretty hefty rubber mounts to just spread the load of it. I, I don't want everything vibrating to pieces over time. And here's a quick look at the completed finish round, which I'm actually very happy with how it turned out. Uh, this is just uh, another piece of thinner uh, flat screen TV uh, plastic, uh, light spread of plastic that I cut out. It's roughly uh, nine square uh, fan sizes big, and it's obviously uh, one fan size there, one fan size there, one fan size there, so it covers the entire fan. And uh, I just uh, di did a couple of diagonal cuts there uh, to uh, let it uh, recline like that. And uh, that is the height, or roughly the height, of a heatsink. And this will just uh, sit basically loose like that. It's going to be crammed in between this wire and the output wire like so. So it's going to basically just uh, sit pretty tight on its own without any actual mounting which is uh, very nice in this application. But I just like the look of this thing. It's, 
almost looks uh, professional. It looked better before I added the uh, tape to and uh, zip ties to strengthen it up. I could have used some more proper mounting method, but uh, I'm not one for doing things properly anyway. And since this unit was originally passively cooled, I had to add uh, a manual fan control uh, to it. This is nothing fancy, these are basically the only components, and uh, it's just a MOSFET which uh, connects 12 volts from the battery straight onto a fan output, which is the connector there. And uh, the way I did this was very, very simple. You know, I found out that this little relay right here, it turns on uh, positive side switched uh, when the UPS turns on. So all I did was connect the gate of a MOSFET uh, to that relay straight across the coil no regard for uh, transients or anything which might come when the coil is switched off I'm coldly counting on that being present on the board and it's handled quite a few turn offs and turn on so I'm figuring that's going to be the case the relay is controlled straight by a transistor going to a microcontroller anyway so you really would expect it to have the proper protection uh, circuit in place already has the pretty much completed top cover. So I've mounted these uh, cut out water bottle things using uh, three screws, one in the front and two on the top, and uh, I've also ta taped them as you can see in order to make them a bit more mechanically sturdy and tight, and I've used uh, hot glue to just uh, secure the screws into the places they're just threaded into the plastic, so I think these are going to stay on quite well. Uh, as you can see we've got the cable mouse running there, uh, the data cable is soldered onto the board so that one's going to get uh, threaded through once I made the board and uh, yeah, that's, that's really elevated as far as the top cover goes. Uh, since this is going to be the top cover and flipped around uh, I'm not going to do anything to seal this area actually because this is going to be the low lowest part of the entire device so it's going to be really uh, difficult for water to actually enter onto the PCB from there because the PCB which is sitting on its base here is going to be mounted uh, about an inch above the lower lip of the case. Uh, I, I might uh, add some grease onto it uh, along the long sides just to uh, give it a bit of resistance but really this is not going to be a major issue for water entrance. Uh, the important thing is that it's going to be able to resist water coming, uh, splashing that way and uh, from the sides where it's relatively close to the tires of a car. And I think it's going to be doing a reasonable job. Alright, so I think we've pretty much reached the final iteration of this thing. So I've pulled out all the wiring, everything is nice and tight, and uh, I've put a considerable amount of grease around the seam there to keep any odd moisture out. Everything seems stable, I remember to wire up a fan and uh, I've built this little uh, extension block to uh, allow me to pull this wire uh, through the firewall of the car uh, while just um, when just screw terminaling it to the front panel which I'm going to, oh which I'm going to uh, mount uh, as a set unit inside of the car so that I don't have to pull up this entire thing uh, through, through the firewall, nor do I ha have room to pull any big connector through through the firewall either. I need to pull just a straight wire. Anyway, I think we'd uh, do it live on camera. First power on after wiring everything up, so here we go. And that looks excellent. I did decide to keep the beeper activated since it does have a dedicated beeper off button. Uh, and since the inverter is technically outside the car, I think it'll be useful since the beeper is not going to be audible inside the car, I don't think. Uh, but uh, if you get out of the car and you've got the inverter turned on, you hear it beeping, and then you'll know, oh dear, I forgot the inverter on. Yep, so, that's about it. Now all I've got to do is figure out a way to measure it in the car. And here is a test mount in the car. And uh, don't tell me that doesn't look great. It fits absolutely perfectly down uh, this little hole where hole between all the stuff we've got the this bolt for the resonator box is making a bit of an issue getting it in uh, as well as this high pressure line for the power steering but beyond that it went in very smoothly <laughs> I, I love the way that looks I truly sincerely do it just looks absolutely 100% out of place uh, 
Anyway, as far as actually mounting it down to the car is going, uh, I think I'm going to do it a bit dirtily. I'll probably just cut a couple of holes in this plastic uh, uh, cover here and uh, just wrap uh, one or two straps around it to keep it in place because it doesn't need to be super sturdily mounted and this plastic piece is uh, quite secure in place. It's uh, attached to a bracket down, back down there, see? It's not going anywhere unless I wanted to. As far as wiring is concerned, uh, the positive and negatives are obviously just going to go straight to the battery over there. No switching, no external fuses, no nothing. Everything's internal. And uh, as far as wiring into the cab goes, uh, I've got a very convenient mounting uh, pass-through point. Let's see, should be right there. That's a grommet going straight into the car between the two seats. So that's going to pass through. Excellent. We can just have a quick look at how it's going to come out. Because that is the very same grommet. So I'll just make a couple of little holes in it. One for the control wire, one for the uh, power wire. And uh, all the wiring through. Uh, I'll probably make the uh, power outlet on the plastic that goes there. That seems uh, like a pretty okay spot. There's no space uh, in between these two. Uh, the plastic uh, cover which goes on this part and this plastic cover that's just about a centimetre of space there. And uh, mounting it uh, atop the existing outlet would just uh, be a bit of a bother. I, I can't use the existing outlet either since that's wired to the a cabin heater stuff, so I'd have to have some kind of switching solution for that and that's more than I can be bothered to make. As far as the control panel is concerned though, I'm not entirely certain as to where to put it. Now, I have considered uh, modifying these uh, blanking plates to accommodate it, but that's, yeah, that's a bit of a bother and rating wiring to the, this part of the dash is a pain in the arse, I know that from experience. So I'm thinking more about just uh, Mounting the control panel perhaps in the bottom of this compartment or just uh, screwing it by the outlet or down there somewhere It's going to be discreet enough. I don't really care about how it looks. All right. It's absolutely dark outside But I've got everything wired up now and ready for a test run. Already had these very wonky polarity swapping uh, uh, terminals uh, on my battery since uh, I'm using a battery which got the wrong terminal orientation so it was very handy to just uh, uh, hook the battery up to part of the adapter, uh, hook the inverter up to part of the adapter. So everything should be good to go. It's nice and tight. And the inverter's wired up down there, strapped down with a couple of stretchy ties. And I haven't uh, tightened everything down. These wires are just uh, loose set for the time being. But uh, we should be good for a first test. Uh, as far as mating everything, I made a bit of a whoopsie and uh, I didn't have any uh, proper electrical outlets in stock so I just used one of these extension cord style ones for the time being and replaced it as soon as possible. And uh, as far as mating the control panel, it's a bit tight down there because the passenger is going to move their feet around and stuff. Uh, and uh, mating it on this part uh, is a bit of a bother because you need to remove the black part Every time you need to access the engine, it just comes off in order to open the hood, which is what I'm sitting on right now. But I just put a magnet uh, on the inside of the black part, so this is just mounted with a magnet, so it uh, comes off if I need to open the hood. I can just uh, throw it aside. Now, obviously, I haven't finished up all the wiring yet, but uh, it should just be a matter of connect pressing the button, and this 40 watt light bulb should light. So here goes nothing. I'd say that's lighting. Beautiful. Well, no light in the inverter, but it's quite obviously running. Doing its thing. Let's uh, see how well you can hear the noise of it inside the car. Probably not too much, given how much soundproofing I've added to this thing. Yeah, that's a faint noise. And I have everything wired up, so all the LEDs are functional. And you can mute the alarm. There you go. Silent running. 
However, the big question is, is this inverter going to be uh, built hard enough to actually handle the alternator running? So, let's just fire the car up and see if the light goes out. It does have a fuse internal to it, so if it shorts out, shouldn't be too big of a deal. Here we go. I probably don't want to have it running while I crank the engine though, that's going to upset something. Right. Yep, that seems to be running just fine. We'll have to see how long it lasts because, you know, dirty electri electricity is going to uh, just gradually eat its way through semiconductors and stuff. So. Uh, it's a bit of a meh kind of situation, but yeah, it's working. We've got 230 volts. Excellent. All right, it has a pretty much completed setup for the time being. Uh, I made this in magnetically on here, so it's sitting quite nicely in place. And uh, I mounted these panels back because I can install a power outlet here without taking any of this off. So yeah, I figured I'd just uh, put it all back and uh, fix this when I can get my ass to town to get a proper out power outlet. Uh, because I'm me, I also stuffed this area with uh, all the rags in order to dampen the sound level of a car. So everything's not running nice and quiet. Uh, but uh, it's a bit of a final thing before we wrap this up. I figured we'd do a little a torture test. Uh, to see what sorts of devices you can power off of this a wonky 300 watt setup. So let's just turn it on. There we go. I'll power it on. Beep it off. And we've got power 225 volts. And I've got an extension cord running there and a few interesting things to try, namely an angle grinder, uh, it's got adjustable power so you can run this very slowly uh, an inductive fan uh, a 32 inch TV and uh, a 40 watt light bulb to just as a simple little indicator, so let's, let's give it a go let's just start out with a light bulb and you get to enjoy my flabby nerdy build that's lighting. Inductive fan. That's lighting. TV. Yeah, we've got picture there, I don't know if you can see it, but it's certainly lighting. So, will it do the angle grind at the same time? I doubt it. Oh. So we're powering a 32 inch TV, an 80 watt inductive fan, a 40 watt light bulb and a 150 watt angle grind at the same time. Not too bad. That certainly is not too bad. So, with that, I guess I'll just have to say thank you for watching. Cheerio. Although, one big question does remain can you start the vehicle with all this stuff running without the inverter resetting? That's probably the ultimate torture test since the battery voltage is going to drop quite considerably. So, let's give it a go. And I would give that a thumbs up. Cheerio.